And since it's timeless, it's always timely. And so today, as we jump into Genesis 26, and you can be turning there, we're going to look at the progression. Because really, as you take, we, we spent um, 13 chapters with Abraham, one of the most prominent, most important individuals and couples, Hain and Sarah, in the history of mankind. And all that we, uh, he, he becomes for us the, the prototype uh, of our own faith. So anybody who over the last 4,000 years has come into right contact with the one true living God has come that, to that position in communion and fellowship with God just like Abraham did. He, and so he's very important. And Abraham had some good days and some bad days. Some days where he was just by faith, walking by faith, and as a result receiving blessings. Other times where he was just walking in fear of the flesh. And as a result, we still bear the burdens of those choices that he made, even to this very day, in the Middle East. But as we jump into chapter 26, what we find is, this is really, um, it's really a case study in many ways of generational faith. In other words, that we see faith passed down. In fact, later Jesus would say, uh, that, speaking of it, uh, the faith Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, that literally that we're to pass down our faith. We live in this crazy day that says, oh man, you should not sort of indoctrinate your kids. They should just grow up and believe whatever they want to believe, which is total garbage. And it's total garbage because we know there's absolute truth and everything else is error. And I was thinking in, in terms of like, if you, you, know, you have little kids and when you're training them about money, a lot of times they think, oh, a nickel, that's more valuable than a dime because it's a little bit bigger, right? And you wouldn't just watch your kid go, oh, you know, give someone a dollar for a dime and just go, oh, you know, you just have to learn their way through it. There's no absolute truth. A dollar's not worth more than a dime. You go, no, there is. A dollar's worth more than a dime. You teach them these things because you know these are, there's truth and there's error in this. Most important thing you'll ever teach your kids, ever in parts of your kids is the truth that Jesus is the, the one ruling, reigning Lord of the universe, and apart from Jesus, no one will ever be saved. In fact, hell is worse than you've ever imagined it to be, and everyone's heading there apart from Jesus. And so, of course, we would want to impart Jesus to our kids. We would want to indoctrinate, if you will, catechize, if you will, our kids, right? Because we want generation to generation, we want to pass along, pass along our faith. And so really, as you, as you study Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, you can really get a, a snapshot of this big flow of Abraham had faith, then Isaac comes in the spotlight, he has faith, right? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, each time the, the spotlight swings to this generation and then the next generation. And what you find is a perfect God is dealing perfectly with imperfect people in every generation. And that's true in our lives today. And so as we look at this, uh, I, I like how one... So titled it, so we're just kind of ripping it off, but uh, God gives shovels, not wells. What we're going to see is that God uh, ultimately equips us to do many of the things that we need to do, but doesn't do them for us. We'll see that as we see today Isaac digging a well, and another well, and another well after that. But we're going to jump in it. Genesis 26 says, now, there was a famine in the land. By the way, what is a famine? There's no food. Right? The water dries up, the crops dry up, it's an agrarian society, everything is difficult. A modern thing would be like, oh, a recession or a depression, where jobs are scarce, and money is scarce, and food is scarce, right? If you think of really tough times, by the way, who brought the famines on the land? God allowed the famines on the land, right? This isn't the first time. Remember back in Genesis 12? What happened? God brought a famine on the land. But isn't this the very land that God says, I'm going to bless you with this land? And you're like, yay! And then there's famine, and you're like, wait, right? You, you ever thought like, okay, God, I get it. You blessed me in this way, but why the difficulty? I think what you find is most of the time, even though you're experiencing God's blessing, there's also difficulty. Because we live in a fallen world, and because God allows things to try and test our faith, right? So, and there was a famine in the land. So in our, in our, in our day, it might be, man, just totally a uh, recession or depression where everyone's really, really struggling. Besides the previous famine that had occurred in the days of Abraham, that was back in Genesis 12. So Isaac went to Gerar, to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. This is most likely not the same Abimelech as we've covered previous to this. Um, the Lord appeared to him and said, do not go down to Egypt. Remember his dad's mistake? Where did he go? He went to Egypt. By the way, in Egypt, he picks up a handmaid by the name of Hagar, who later he has a child with. 
who is seen as, by the Muslims and uh, many of the Arabs across the Middle East, they're the father of their faith, right? Abraham through Ishmael. Well, causing a lot of problems. He tells Isaac, do not go down there. Now, when uh, stay in the land, which I will tell you, when God told them stuff, it wasn't like modern Christianity. When people tell you today, God told me, most likely he did You have people these days tell you, God told me this person is getting saved. God told me this. God told me that. That isn't, by the way, what Abraham said. Abraham said that literally God showed up and spoke to him, right? And Hebrews 1 says that that was his common way of dealing with the patriarchs and the prophets back in those days. Is that the common way he deals with us today? It is not. In Hebrews 1, he says this. 1-1. One, one. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days, has spoken to us in his son. We, we live in this day where it's just crazy. and Everyone wants to say, God told me, God told me, God told me. And they have no fear about that. And there should be. Because if you say God has said and God hath not said, God doesn't play games around that, right? And so people want to say, God told me this and God told me that. Most of the time it's just not even remotely true. But when Abraham said and Isaac said, God spoke to me, it was completely true, right? It was completely true. And so when God says, I'm going to come tell you where you should go, he was literally going to tell him where he should go, not, not so that Isaac didn't have to base it on his emotions, right? These days we have God dwelling in us, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has written to us 66 complete books. So if you want to hear from God, get real familiar, not with one or two of them, but all 66. By the time you get real familiar, you're going to go be as Jesus, right? You're never going to plumb the depths of all that the Holy Spirit has to tell you. The question is, do you want to hear it? Because if you really want to hear the voice of God, you've got to throw the word up behind. Because the Holy Spirit has spoken and is speaking today. And He is speaking to us through these 66 books and the Holy Spirit He has given to us. Acts 2 says we'll head into, in the last days, there will again be, in a common way, visions and dreams and these type things. So we say yes. And when the moon turns to blood and darkness and all the things that are described during the tribulation are happening, there will also be a lot of these unique experiences that were common at different points. But he says, I, will, I shall tell you, sojourn in this land and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and to your descendants I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath which I swore to Father Abraham. Mm. By the way, when God makes a promise, He's never broken. And you know that He's made you promises. He's made me promises. And a lot of Christians probably would have an easier time naming sitcoms on TV than promises that God's made to them. Wouldn't that be strange? But that's the unfortunate day, is it? We should know very well what promises God's made to us. And not all the promises in the Bible are directed to us. Some of the promises that God made directly to Israel are different than the promises He's made to us in the New Covenant, right? The New Testament, on this side of the cross. And so we need to become very familiar with the promises of God. So if someone came up to you and said, Man, David, what? Tell me five things God promised you. He, he should be able to go, yeah, man, listen to these things. You wouldn't believe it, man. This is what God has promised to me. Wow. I mean, they're extravagant, right? The promises of God. There's many of them. But he says, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and will give your descendants all these lands and by your descendants all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Again, this is a passage about blessing. It's a, a passage about faith and faithfulness, and God richly blessing that. 
But when we're talking about descendants, we live in a culture, we were talking about this during the equipping hour, we live in a culture that sees children as a burden, not a blessing, right? And so that there's literally huge swaths of America fighting to go, we should be able to kill them. That's just normal, natural stuff, kill babies. There's nothing normal and natural about killing babies, right? It's just backwards. But we live in this culture that so despises uh, children and descendants that we're willing to kill them before they even come out of the womb. But when you read the Bible, there's a sense in which like children are a blessing, and they, and and we're to look generationally. Man, what an, just an amazing blessing! You get kids, and, and, and then you get to meet their kids, and, and, and if the Lord allows you to live long enough, you get to meet their kids' kids, and and, and family is an amazing blessing, and something that we should be raising up kids in this me generation to think. It's not me, me, me. It's God and others, and having a family and raising up kids and seeing their grand, seeing your grandkids. And these are blessings, right? And then going into the kingdom of God and and going to meet those who know the Lord and, and walk with the Lord that, that that have gone ahead of you, and then one day getting to see your kids and grandkids showing up in heaven and getting to hug on them and say, "Man, you're here with Jesus." And, I get to be around you too. This is an amazing, amazing blessing. So into this death culture, we need to bring life. Into this anti-kids, think of only today culture, we need to bring children our blessing. And we live for generational things, right? But that is decisions you make today. Right? If you want to live for kids and grandkids and for the glory of God and, and utilizing these things, then, then the decisions you make with your money and time and your efforts and what you're doing, should reflect that. So he says, uh, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. If you remember, that's exactly what he told them in Genesis 12, 3. So he's reiterating the promise, the covenant we made with Abraham to his son Isaac, and he likewise all the way up to the ultimate fulfillment in Jesus Christ. But he says, because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So you go, man, Abraham, if for all of his faults, God looks and says, that man loved me, he believed in me, and he obeyed me, and he followed me, right? And, and, and ultimately, wouldn't you want God to say that of you? Like, man, God, if you could hear the booming voice of God, it says, Brian loved me, he believed me, he followed me, and he obeyed me. Can you imagine standing in the presence of God and hearing God in the presence of all the witnesses that have gone ahead of before us and said, well done. My good and faithful servant. I mean, that's what we're living for. That's what we're creating for. The worship of the living God. That one day, right? One day we get well done. You follow me, you believe me, you obey me, and you love me, right? Mm. Abraham was that man. And if you look through it, if you look at the things that he did wrong, you would go, wow, this guy. But if you look through the lens of God's mercy and grace, you go, this guy. This guy had amazing faith. Right? We look at it and go, didn't you give your wife to guys two different times and lie really effectively in those times? Right? Didn't you just sort of wing it and go down to Egypt? I mean, there's didn't you your wife came up with a terrible idea and you went with along with it and slept with another lady and had a you could look at a few things in this life and go, what a clown, right? But God, being rich in mercy, looks at it and says, and this is why in Hebrews 11 is such an encouragement to all of us. He looks and he sees those things that we did by faith, and he says, man, look how they believe me. Look how they trust me. And so it's about faith, isn't it? Well, he says, so Isaac lived in Gerard. When the men of that place asked about his wife, uh-oh, he said, she is my Sister, I wonder where he came up with such a foolish, stupid idea as this. Where do you think he would have seen this happen? His dad. We call this generational sin. Generational sin is when you do the same sins your parents did. Do you think that happens very often? You think it happens where, let's say, uh, a parent is just angry all the time? And lo and behold, they raise up a kid that's angry all the time. Don't know how that happened. It's kind of like Abraham. Dude, this is 
it's my sister. Isaac, whoa, this is my sister. Hmm. It's very important that you understand and you're aware that you may well be doing sins that your parents did. And that God does not say that's okay. That each generation needs to break free of the sins of the previous one. While loving and embracing and receiving from the parents the things that they did well and trusting the Lord and following the Lord and all these things. They also need to break free of those sins. Have you ever seen a family that over the generations they all are still in the same sin? All that? The grandfather was drunk and the father was a drunk and now the son's a drunk. Have you ever seen that? grandfather was angry, and then the son was angry, and the grandson is angry. Like, where does it end? Where does it end? Someone has to choose to break free of it, right? Someone has to choose to say, these were generational sins in my life. They were in my family's life, and they're not going to be in my life now. Can you choose that in Christ? You can choose that in Christ. By faith, you can say, no, I am going to break this cycle, right? What are some of the things generational and sins? What are some of the generational sins that we see in people's lives? Can you think of any? Alcoholism? Yeah. Drugs? Cheating? Anger. Anger? Can you think of any other generational sins? Cat lovers. <laughs> <laughs> Not against that one. Uh, so, generational sin. This is what happens when you open it up. You almost have to. Have, you almost have to open it up when James is in the restroom like that. And then you can open it up and not get to some weird, weird off the wall uh, statement. But, anyways, yeah. Uh, gluttony, greed, laziness. In each of our lives, we need to say, man, how could Isaac? You would think all people, Isaac, would look at it and go, dude, you did that to my mom, right? And then he does the same thing to his wife. Wouldn't you think that somebody who grew up around someone who was an alcoholic would go, I saw that, I would never, and then he had the same thing. Or, man, that you would think they would go, man, they were so angry all the time. I will never, and then what happens? They're angry. I'm telling you, as believers, we need to say, I need to walk by faith in ways that my family over generations did not. If you find yourself doing similar things, simple things, you really need to stop and say, man, that is not what God has called us to do. And we need to break free of those things. And so, in Jeremiah, in fact, it is, uh, that people kind of use that as an excuse. You ever seen somebody use that as an excuse? Well, my family's always been, you know, whatever it is. And sometimes we kind of excuse it away. My family's always been gluttonous. My family's always been angry. My family's always been lazy. My family's always been anxious. My family's always been, you name it. But this is what he says in Jeremiah 31. In those days, they will not say again, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone will die for his own iniquity. Each man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth will be set on edge. And the idea there is this. The big idea is this. You're responsible for you no matter what you saw your parents do. You're responsible for you no matter what you saw your parents do. Because you have the Spirit of God, and you can believe the Word of God, and you can go in a different path. And each generation should be successfully growing more with the Lord, more faithful to the Lord. Now, Isaac seems to have at least made an improvement. He only gives his wife away once, not twice, right? So we're, we're going in the right direction. You need to think about that. And so he says, she's my sister, for he was afraid to say, my wife, thinking the men of the place might kill me on account of Rebecca, for she is beautiful. Just the exact same thing as dad did. It came about when he had been there a long time. So how long is his wife in a situation where at any point someone could sleep with her? A long time. If they're talking the Old Testament a long time, it's a long time. Like, for us, it's a long time. It's like, really? It's a stupid teabag. It's got a minute. Like, you're like, come on. 
Yeah. Right? That's a long time. You know, when they talk in the Old Testament, a long time, we're talking a long time. So this lady is in the situation where at any point someone can sleep with her. And this dude is allowing it to go on day after day, week after week, month after month. Just, oh, there goes my beautiful wife. I gave her away. And for a long time. That, uh, it came about when he had been there a long time, that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out through a window and saw, and behold, Isaac was caressing his wife, Rebekah. Then Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, certainly she's your wife. How then did you say, she is my sister? And Isaac told him, Because I said, I, said, I might die on account of her. By the way, most of the fears we have are unfounded. Most of the things that you're like, I'm so anxious, this is just going to turn out so poorly. She's my wife, right? He gives his... It was all in his head. Actually, they had no intention of killing him. Bimelech said, what is this you've done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. He had no intention of sleeping with another man's wife. In fact, he has a better conscience than Isaac, just like his father. His father's conscience wasn't his father's and pagans around him. Talk about unfounded. You know most of the things we worry about are completely unfounded. They're assuming the situation is going to turn out the worst, and they're always removing God from the equation, right? Isaac, Abraham. These were men of God. These were men of faith. And yet, how quickly they could remove God from the situation and be in utter fear and make choices out of fear. Any choices you make out of fear are usually going to be very bad choices, right? Abimelech said, uh, oh, so Abimelech charged all the people saying, he who touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Actually, the exact opposite of what he feared was true, right? He was like, they will kill me if I don't lie and say she's my sister. Actually, Abimelech comes and says, what in the world are you talking about? And makes a decree, anyone who even thinks about it, you touch this woman, I'll kill you. It was the exact opposite. When you start to fear, you should stop and say, this isn't playing with reality because I've removed God from the equation. If you're thinking rightly, you're thinking with God out to bless you, and God working for you, and God orchestrating providentially the circumstances of your life to work for good for you. That's when you function in faith, going, no, God is for me, God is with me, God is working all things for his glory and my good by conforming me to the image of God. That's Romans 8, 28. So he says, So Abimelech charged all people, saying, You touch this man or his wife, shall surely be put to death. Now Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. Here's the thing God is causing the sowing to reap a hundredfold, right? So Isaac is prospering in the land of Gerar. What's the problem with that? He wants to be prospering in the land of Canaan. You see, sometimes it's easy for us to think on what God hasn't given us rather than what He has given us. It's easier for us to think on what God isn't doing for me rather than what God is doing for me. If you want to live by faith, you've got to live in and rejoice in what God is doing for you, not what you say He should do for you. What God has blessed you with, not what you think He should bless you with. And so, ultimately... You and I live in the same situation. At any given point, at any given day, or any given week, you could look at the things that you go, man, if only God would do this, rather than, I'm so thankful God is doing this. If only God would grant me that I could live in Canaan, rather than, thank you, Lord, for blessing me in Gerard. Right? It wasn't the place he wanted to be, but it was the place he was taken to by God. And he was to trust God and to bless God, and to praise God, because God was blessing him. And what you'll find is, God is at work providentially in your life, and he's working to bless your life. But also, alongside of all blessings, almost always you'll find difficulties. And you have to pick which one you're going to focus on. You're either going to focus on the providential hand of God, and what he has given you, and you're going to rejoice, and you're going to worship, and you're going to, to call on his name, thanksgiving. Or, you're going to say, you haven't given me, you haven't done for me, and you're going to live in complaint and grumbling and misery. 
The fact is he could not change this outcome. Most of the circumstances in life, many of them, are out of your control, but your attitude is always in your control. Whether you're going to choose to worship God in any given situation is always in your control. Many of the other things, most of the circumstances and situations in life, many of them are completely out of your control. So he says, uh, and now Isaac sowed the land and reaped in the same land a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. And the man became rich and continued to grow richer until he became very wealthy. Now we live in a culture that says the wealthy are evil. You notice that? The rich must be wrong because you only get rich according to the Marxist philosophies now prevalent in culture. You can only get rich because you've mistreated the poor. Do some people get rich for mistreating the poor? Yeah. There are evil rich, but there are also righteous rich. Do some people get rich because God makes them wealthy? Yeah. So there are righteous rich, as Isaac was, as Abraham was, and there are unrighteous rich, right? People who gain through usury or high interest, all these things that the scripture speaks on. But we need to not fall into the lie that culture believes that, oh, if you're, you know, if you're wealthy, you must be wrong. If you're poor, you must be good. You know what? Are there evil poor people? Yes. There are poor people who are very evil. Are there poor people who are very righteous? Yes. Because whether you have a lot or little has nothing to do with your relationship to God. You can be very rich and have a very close relationship to God. You can be very poor and have a very close relationship with God. You can be very poor and hate and despise God. You can be very rich and hate and despise God. It has nothing to do with wealth. And this whole sameness doctrine is really just Marxism and philosophies of this world that, like other philosophies, simply tries to remove God from the equation and say, how great a utopia we could build if there was no God in the equation. By the way, you can't build a utopia without God in the equation. You can only build disaster. You can only take injustice and put it on steroids and destroy human lives. But when you put God as the centerpiece, all of a sudden you can start orchestrating things to be a blessing to people. But only God knows how to orchestrate life to be a blessing. So he says, For he had possessions of flocks and herds and a great household, so the Philistines envied him. Now all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, the Philistines stopped up by filling them with earth. The Philistines like him? No. One of the ways you got rid of somebody is you just kept filling up the wells, right? Was a well easy to dig? Can you imagine? If you took a field trip over to the Middle East, handed Alex a shovel, there's water down there. Right? Can you imagine standing out in the Middle East in the desert? Just keep digging until you hit water. Even Giovanni would give up. Maybe his dad would. He got to meet his family. Uh, his, they own an uh, Italian restaurant out in Kerrville, and they're like, oh, so you, is his dad in here? Does he live with you guys? Yeah, but he works construction. How old is his dad? Maybe he'd keep digging. But the fact is, this was no easy work. So you want to run someone out of there, you just kept filling in the wells. And that's what the Philistines did. Stop them up by filling them up with earth. So Abimelech said to Isaac, go away from us, for you are too powerful for this. So they even recognized, not because of miracles, but because of God's providential hand in Isaac's life, this guy has a connection to God. It's just unbelievable. Everything seems to turn around. You ever watch in Christians who are imperfect still, everything seems to turn around for them? Like, how does that work? Why would that happen to you? Why? I can't believe that went well. I, I don't know. It's just that it doesn't make sense. You're like, because God's providential hand is on my life, right? That doesn't mean everything turns golden. But it does mean that you'll see a lot of things. You go, I should never have panned out that well, right? Because God is with us. A perfect God working perfectly with imperfect people. Well, uh, then Isaac dug again the wells of water which he had been, which had been dug in the days of his father Abraham. And the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. And he gave them this, the same names which his father had given them. But when Isaac's servants dug in the valley, they found there a well of water flowing. The herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with the herdsmen of Isaac, saying, The water is ours. So he named the well Essek because they contended with him. Then they dug another well, 
and they quarreled over it too. So he named it Sidna. He moved away from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it, so he named it Raboth. For he said, at last the Lord has made room for us, and we will be fruitful in this land. Then he went up from Beersheba, the Lord appeared to him the same night, and said, I am the Lord God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for the sake of, of the servant Abraham. What you'll notice is God didn't give him a well. God gave him a shovel. We live in a modern Christian age that says, well, if God's going to do it, he'll give me the well. They'd just be sitting there, right? To let go of my God crowd, right? He'll give me the well. No, he gave you a shovel. Start digging, right? How many people would be like, man, I'm just, just waiting for just this word from God whether I should dig a well? Like, no. Your family's thirsty? Get the shovel and start digging, right? Like, there's things in life that you just need to be about. Right? So he digs you up. How many Christians would give up after that when they filled it back in, fought over, filled it back in, or took it? And they'd be like, must not have been God's will for me to get a well. It wasn't Isaac's response, right? Isaac takes a shovel, moves down the way, digs another well. It's going to be pretty tough, by the way, to keep digging wells in the Middle East, right? And this one, too, gets taken. And instead of quitting, instead of giving up, let's keep moving. And let's dig again. Isn't that the type of dude you'd want your daughter to marry, by the way? Someone just goes, man, I'm not quitting, I'm not giving up. I'm just going to keep digging. God's not going to give me a well, he's going to give me a shovel, right? You see, faith means that I believe that God is for me and God is with me. That God will ultimately bless my efforts, but I don't know what efforts he's going to mainly bless, right? He finally digs the last one. Can you imagine how exhausting this would have been? By the last one, you'd be like, dude, can't we move to a city? Can't we move, like, let's go move next to some water, some body of water or something, right? Let's stop digging. The fact is, for us today, a lot of times... Men, you, we're to provide for our family. That may mean, hey, you've got to start a business, and if that doesn't work, start the next one. And go get a job, and if that one doesn't pay out, you keep working, you keep <coughs> laboring. It's not like, man, this should go easy. If it's God's will, it'll go easy. That's just a modern Christian thought, right? It really didn't come from the Bible. If you read the Bible, you go, you, you'd almost think the opposite. Like, man, <laughs> for the men and women of faith, Life is just constantly got headwinds, and yet God keeps blessing. So you've got to say, man, I'm going to keep looking at the blessing and rejoicing in the blessings, but I'm going to keep moving against these headwinds with faith that God is for me, and God wants me to take responsibility of what he's asking me to do. And so he said, uh, he told him, I'm the God, Father of Abraham, you know, and do not fear, which is, by the way, the most repeated command in all, all of the Bible. And we live in the most fearful society, right? Anxiety-riddled society, even though we're the most wealthy society, right? But as Christians, it strictly commands us over and over and over, don't fear. And you can see why we shouldn't fear. God's providential hand is on you. God is with you and for you. God is blessing you. And you've got to focus on, and I've got to focus on, what ways is God blessing me today? And what are the things God's given me today? Not what has God not done for me today? Or what is God not doing yet for me that I would maybe complain and grumble about? And he says, So he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants dug the well. And so you go, what does he end up? He ends up in worship, right? He ends up just celebrating God. Like, man, he didn't go, God, it's about time. Like, this is, how many dwells have we got? He didn't say that, right? He didn't say, man, I wish we were over here or over there. He just said, God, thank you for your goodness and grace. And he recognized that even though his servants had dug the wells, who was it that provided the water in the well? Ultimately, it was God. So even when you and I work or labor to provide a living for our families or this or that, you ultimately need to reckon, it's all the Lord. When we have food on the table, the reason we're praying is not some formality. It's because it's literally the grace of God that provides us with food. It's literally the grace of God that provides us with a roof over our heads, right? These last verses real quick. Then Abimelech came to him from Gerar with his advisors, Abuzeth and Phicol, and the commander of his army. Isaac said to them, why have you come here since you hate me and have sent me away from you? 
They said, We see plainly that the Lord has been with you. you. So we said, Let there now be an oath between us, even between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you. This was the complete opposite. He thought he was getting killed by these people. These people are actually all about wanting a covenant and agreement so he doesn't get them. It's just crazy. It was the exact opposite of everything he thought, right? Let us now be an oath between us, even between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you that you will do us no harm. Who are they concerned about doing harm? They're actually concerned that Isaac has such a connection with God that harm will come to them. Isaac was so terrified of them, he gave his wife away and lied about the whole thing. All you need to know is that God is with you and God is for you, right? And if you're trusting that, you can have great confidence. Just as we have not touched you and have not done and have done to you nothing but good, and have sent you away in peace, you are now the blessed of the Lord. So they recognized, man, just what God had promised, they were experiencing, they were blessed. Then he made them a feast, and they ate and drank. In the morning they arose early and exchanged oath. Then Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace. Now it came about on the same day that Isaac's servants came and had told him about the well, which they had dug and said to him, We have found water. So he called it Sibah. Therefore the name of the city is Bathsheba to this day. When Esau was forty years old, he married Judith, the daughter of Bere the Hittite, and Bashemoth, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and they brought grief to Isaac and Rebekah. At the very end, you had this little snippet, right? But Esau brings them grief. So here, Isaac is just doing amazing. Not that he doesn't have faults and failures, he does. But he trusts and loves the Lord, and he's striving to do everything that God told him to do. And at the very end, you have the wayward prodigal son, Esau. And Esau brought them much grief. Prodigals bring a ton of grief, don't they? Prodigal kids bring immense grief to their parents and to their families, right? They bring burden after burden after burden. And you say, man, maybe you're dealing with a prodigal. All you can do is pray and entrust them to the hands of a loving God, right? And recognize that ultimately God is completely capable of turning the hearts of kings and anyone else, right? Anyone in their hearts back. But ultimately, he also allows mankind to make many choices. Sometimes, many bad choices until they hit a very bad bottom, right? And so Esau is a wayward prodigal that continues to be grief and burden. What we want to do is say, man, in the midst of chaos, confusion, difficulty, and a broken world, we can have blessing and a rich fellowship with God. That's true, isn't it? We can have blessing and rich fellowship with God by walking by faith. Isaac walked by faith. He wasn't perfect, but he was faithful. He had faith and he was faithful. Our goal each day that God gives us life should be, man, what's your goal today? To be faithful. Oh, you've got to have bigger goals than that. Nope, that's the highest goal. That's my highest goal on any given day, right? Just be faithful. Well, how do you be faithful? You have faith. And then you, you go out of that faith. Now, what if, if I believe this... How can I do according to it? That's faithfulness, right? I have faith, therefore I want to be faithful. And so you go, man, your greatest goal tomorrow, the Lord will wake you up and say, oh, my one and only goal today, to be faithful. To be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Abraham, faithful. Say, if that's faithfulness, I'm okay. Because, <laughs> you know, I didn't marry my sister and I didn't give my wife away, right? You, you go, okay, right? You know, faithfulness is us believing the truth. And unfortunately, many times we fail. But we should look back at those failures. Isaac should have looked at the failure of Abraham giving his wife away and said, I'm not going to do that and broken that chain. But unfortunately, he didn't. I would encourage you today, in a broken, hurting world, we can live a blessed, intimate life with God. And we need to ask ourselves, are there things that we need to break free from that are generational sins in our life? And if so... We need to set out today in prayer, in repentance, to break free from those chains. Also, we need to recognize, am I focused on the rich blessings of God and what He's done for me, or what I think He should do for me? One leads to worship, one leads to complaint, worry, and, and, and ultimately depression. Am I thankful for all God has given me, or am I complaining and grumbling for what He hasn't? Worship is over here. God is with me and for me. God has blessed me immensely. He may not have done everything I would want him to do. He may not be fixing everything I want him to fix, but he's fixed everything that he thinks should be fixed at this point. He is doing everything for me. He's a perfect God, perfectly working with me, an imperfect person. 
And so even the trials and tribulations he allows to come my way in this broken, hurting world are still coming through the hands of a loving Father. And I want to live a blessed life of faithfulness and be faith, have faith and faithfulness so I can live in intimacy and blessing with the Lord. Let's pray. Father, in the same way Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph had faith and walked faithfully, we seek to have faith and walk faithfully. And we're just asking your spirit to just increase our faith. That we would hunger more deeply for your word. That we would long more deeply for intimacy and communion with you, Lord. And even as we were just about to take communion here, that we would celebrate. That you actually already pay for all of our sins. That you already broke us free from all the dominating sins in our life. Not only the sins that currently have come upon us, but the ones that generationally that we've learned. That you literally set us free from all of these things at the cross through your blood. And, and we need to now live by faith, believing in truth, and then walking faithfully in that truth. So as we come to this communion table, Lord, we just ask that you would just cause in our hearts to, that you would just through your spirit convict us uh, of anything that we need to repent of, turn from right now. Encourage us as well, Lord, that this victory belongs to you, that you've already accomplished the victory on our behalf. We get the opportunity now to come into your presence because your blood was spilled on our behalf, and our sin was covered, and the wrath of God was appeased against us. And so we thank you, Lord, and as we take these communion elements, Lord, that we would just rejoice that we're free, that we're beloved of God, that we are close and intimate with you in, in our standing, and we want to be that in our, in our just practice daily, that we could enjoy that fellowship and bring you pleasure and, and worship. So we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, I pray. So I just invite you to come up and